interesting what you just said. Uh, one of uh, Terrence McKenna's lectures, he talked about a, a very profound psychedelic experience that he had where he was given this revelation that the world is made out of words. Mm -hmm. That everything is made out of words. Mm -hmm. Like he had just some sort of a profound understanding of what r words really mean. Well, how much of the reality that surrounds you has been, what would you say, uh, has emerged out of the realm of possibility because of what you've said? A lot. And you have this huge influence on the world. And so there's an insistence in the Judeo-Christian canon that whatever, that the capacity that words have to shape possibility is akin or identical to the process that generates reality itself. And I think that's true. That's, that's why in the opening chapters of Genesis were described as formulated in the image of God. Or like a microcosm of the process that gives rise to order itself. It's a very different view than the than the bottom-up materialistic view, let's say, of the of the Enlightenment and the scientific world. It's a different way of looking at things. It's the notion that what is in front of you is a field of indeterminate possibility. It's got some implicit structure, as the scientists insist, but it's it's open, and you grapple with it like you grapple with your dawning conscience in the morning, consciousness in the morning. What confronts you in the morning is a field of possibility. And you approach that with a, a certain kind of orientation. And you use your words and your linguistic capacity to think to shape that possibility. And if you do that properly, then you make, this is the Genesis 1 insistence again, you make the order that's good or very good. And that depends on your orientation. So in the Sermon on the Mount, for example, which is an instruction manual, Christ tells his listeners how to orient themselves in the world properly. So he says, first, aim with all your heart at the highest good you can imagine. Now, you'll get better at that as your vision clears, but that's the orientation, to do what's right. Now, you might say, like Pontius Pilate said, well, what is right, what is truth, but most people know the difference between right and wrong. You know at least step by step what would move you forward and upward. So you orient yourself to the highest possible upward place. Then you make the assumption that other people have the same intrinsic value that you do. So that's your initial aim and presumption. And then you pay attention to the moment. And that's, well, that's, that's often the statement that gets Christ confused with the hippies, you know, to consider the lilies of the field who don't toil or spin. But that's not the instruction. The instruction is to aim up with everything and then having that firmly in mind to pay attention to each moment to allow the words to come to you that best suit that upward aim, not to subordinate your language to your own machinations or manipulations or your own hedonistic desire, but towards what's right. And if you do that, then what emerges out of possibility is akin to the garden, to the original garden in, in Genesis 1, and it's the order that's good. Truth, truthful language brings about the order that's good. And that's, uh, well, I, that's a very accurate way of portraying the role consciousness plays in bringing about reality. So, and that's a, it's not, that, that viewpoint, by the way, isn't limited to the Judeo-Christian canon. You see the same thing in the Taoist representation, because in the Taoist world, you have a domain of order, that's the black serpent, and you have a domain of chaos, sorry, I have it reversed, the domain of order is the white serpent, and the domain of chaos, or possibility, is the black serpent in the Taoist image, the two snakes head to tail. And your job is to walk the line between them. And you can tell when you're walking that line because that's where things are maximally meaningful. And so that's another element of this vision, which is that if you orient yourself with upward aim and you straddle the line between order and chaos, then things become maximally meaningful around you. So, and Musk, you know, I, I just did a podcast with Elon Musk and he talked about resolving his 
existential crisis. The existential crisis that he experienced when he was about 11 or 12 was a crisis of faith, essentially. And the way that he resolved that and then motivated himself so intensely was by understanding that if he pursued the path of the, of the expansion of knowledge, that that would be intrinsically meaningful. That's the path of growth. That's the path of adventure. All of that. And it's aligned with what matures you and makes you more responsible and sets the world in order. And the, the, the instinct of meaning signifies all that. And so I've written a lot about that in, in this new book, we, we Who Wrestle With God. And that's what I've been lecturing about in 60 different cities, walking through these biblical stories um, one by one, partly because we have this wrestling match going on in our culture, let's say, between the nihilists and the atheists and the, and the true believers, you might say. And one of the faults of that war is that no one stops to elucidate or delineate exactly what it is that we're arguing about. 